Thanks in advance for joining us. You know something about this photograph, and uh, I know it's just kind of a coy way to get going, but uh, do you know anybody in this picture, and, and what would you like to tell us about this photo? I do. I, I discovered um, I discovered four of these pictures uh, in, uh, in a manila envelope from the Secretary of Interior um, a few years ago, and they're all by a White House photographer, Abby Rowe, um, of the, the signing of of uh, the point lays uh, point raise enabling legislation. So uh, it's September 13th, 1962. My father's on the far right of this picture. He's the um, graying, sort of tall graying guy. He has gray up top, mine is now below. I've lost all mine in that region. Um, he's, uh, he represents the environmentalists at this, at this signing. He's, um, except they weren't environmentalists yet. Uh, that word hadn't really been in currency. He was a conservationist, and he would continue to be a conservationist until you know, around Earth Day, when, in around 1970, when, when the word environmentalist went into vogue. Uh, on the far left uh, of this picture is, is uh, Wayne Aspinall of Colorado, Congressman of Colorado. It's fortunate they, they have these two guys at opposite ends of the room, because uh, Wayne Aspinall is sort of the scourge of the environment of the conservation movement at this stage. He's um, he's 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 successfully uh, kept uh, stop passage of the Wilderness Act for about seven years. Uh, he will uh, by the time it uh, in two more years he will have succeeded in stopping this uh, Wilderness Act uh, Wilderness Bill for for um, seven years, just stalling it in committee. Uh, my dad once said of him. Um, uh, Dream after dream, uh, dream after dream, of ours has been dashed on the stony continents of, 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 uh, of Aspinall, and they 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 liked each other, but they fought a lot. Um, at Kennedy's uh, right to the right of John Kennedy is is Clem is Clem Miller, who is the author of the uh, Point Reyes enabling le legislation. And he's sort of the point man in the campaign to make this park happen. And that's why he's so happy. Um, he, um, he suspects at this moment that this will be the high point of his career. He's only been a congressman for two years, but he thinks this is gonna be his crowning achievement. Uh, three guys from the left is Stuart Udall, the Secretary of Interior, who, who really is the muscle in Washington behind all national seashores, um, and especially this one, he, he, he worked hard for this for this passage of this legislation and of course Kennedy is signing the um is signing the bill this little there's a little pile to to the right of Kennedy with all the signing pens I have one before me now the one of the one, those pens in that pile that my dad passed on to me and um so it's a, it's a big moment um the poignant thing about this picture is that they look so happy to me they they, they look so triumphant um and this picture is such a nice, glossy, has a feeling of being fresh from the dark room to me. The, the, uh, the black and whites are so, the contrasts are so strong. Okay. Uh, the photographer Abby Rowe actually studied uh, with Ansel Adams, so that's where he got so contrasty, I think. But um, the poignancy is that Kennedy, who's signing the bill, has, has a year and nine days left for his assassination. And Clem Miller, who stands right behind him, is, is um, is suspect really thought this was going to be the high point. Well, he has only 28 days left to live before the, the plane crash that, that kills him. So, to me, uh, what's sad about it is we can't we can't question any of these guys about their intent that day, what they hoped for this national seashore. Um, and that's too bad because that is the issue being debated right now. Uh, my father's role in this was to was to among other things, um, lobby on both coasts for this bill. He lobbied out here, he lobbied in Washington. He published this book, uh, Island in Time, the Point Reyes Peninsula, uh, by Harold Gilliam, the, the great chronicle environmental writer, probably the greatest environmental writer we had ever uh, in a newspaper, and commissioned him to do the text. Phil Hyde did the pictures, um, sort of my dad's go-to photographer, and 
And my dad's um, system in those days, his custom, was to hand, hand out copies of the book, of any book that the Sierra Club published that, was, um, that had relevance to legislation that was coming up. And you can see the book on, under everybody's hand. Clem Miller, the author of the legislation, has it under his left arm. He's standing, looking down at the president. Wayne Aspinall doesn't want his book. He's, he's my dad's enemy. He's put it on the Resolute desk. Um, <laughs> Uh, Stuart Udall is holding the book in his hand. So this was one of the ways the Sierra Club got its its message around through this very vital publishing program that, um, that my dad started. So it's a, a little bit of history, and it, to me, it, it just it's political. Hmm? It just it, it just uh, for me it always sets me in that period. Liz, uh, I, I don't know if, if we can um, mute uh, the crowd in, until we get through, uh, but let's see how it goes. But I, I wonder if that's available to you as, as um, host. Well, I can mute all, but I don't want to mute you too. So what I'm doing is I am going through and muting everybody one at a time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all the participants are getting muted one at a time. <sighs> Thank I think I, think and, I got it. So um, you alluded to this, the um, intent uh, of the use of the park, uh, as, as probably most people on the phone know, is, is very much uh, an issue. Um, normally, if it's about use of public lands or about leases or about uh, such, um, you know, um, grave uh, um, issues with money involved and, and, and so on, uh, things are normally uh, written down and, and lawyers and contracts and, and lawmakers go over them. So um, one would think that uh, there wouldn't be ambiguity about the use of the park and the intended use of the park so, such that even if people unfortunately are not around to be consulted, uh, wh where is the uh, sort of intrigue and ambiguity coming from uh, in, in this case? Well, there's always ambiguity in the law. That's why we have lawyers, and and um, and uh, and that's why we have the Supreme Court to to help interpret them. But but um, the there's really no ambiguity in in the original intent of any of these folks. Um, what we've heard since uh, the the issue now, of course, is 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 ranching in the park. A third of the uh, the national seashore is in a pastoral zone. Um, of, of beef and, and dairy ranches. And uh, the argument is being made today that it was, um, that this is a part and parcel of the park. It was um, always the intent that, um, that the park would, would have ranching in it. And in fact, people like our Congressman Jared Huffman, who's, who's taken over the, more or less the district of Clem Miller, who wrote the law, talks about this beautiful mosaic of, of uh, rural land, rural uh, working ranches and wilderness that the, park, that the park presents to us. This was never the intent of any of the men in this room or any of the people on this coast that, who fought for it, Marty Griffin and, and Marin County and, and, and Ed Weyburn of the Sierra Club, the people, who, uh, the people who made this park happen never saw it that way. Um, the park was first proposed by Connie Worth, who of uh, the Park Service, who later became the director of the National Park Service. In 1935, he, he was he proposed the he proposed this park. Um, he never, and he continued to fight for it all the way through to this to this day, uh, documented in the photograph, because he was in 1951 through 1964, he was the he was the director of the Park Service. He continued to fight for the park. He never mentioned at any stage of his career, ranches as being a virtue or an asset in these parts. No mention of ranches. He, all he talked about was the biodiversity of this place, its nearness to, its nearness to a megalopolis, um, and, uh, and its beauty. Uh, and Clem Miller, who we see in this picture and who wrote the legislation, never, never sold this park as a a, a, a ranching as being a virtue of this park. The opposite, completely the opposite. When he, 
uh, argued this case with, with his, the case for Point Reyes for making it a park in Congress with his colleagues. He didn't use this as a selling point because a congressman at that time, Republicans inclu included, uh, were leery of the idea of, of um, commercial ranching in a national park. This is not what we normally think of as being desirable in a national park. So we had to sort of convince them that the ranchers wouldn't be there long. And there was a reason to believe they wouldn't be. Um, uh, so, so this notion that, that somehow ranching is a, a boon in this park and is integral is just false. Uh, as far as the founders go, the, the, the people in this room, the people who made it happen, didn't, were not thinking that way, and they never spoke that way. Ranching was to be a stopgap measure. It was to uh, uh, the existing ranchers, th th there were not funds enough to acquire the park in the beginning. The ranchers um, sold, out to the, sold out to the park, banked the money, and they continued to work uh, their old ranches on leases. Um, the deal was that uh, they would get 25 years to the life of the spouse, and then that was the, that was the term that they stay on. It was a transition period that was to allow the ranchers to find other work to make the transition themselves. It was to allow uh, Marin County to uh, sort of accommodate or ma make up for the loss of tax base in the federal, in this land that was going over to the feds. And it was never intended as something uh, that would be there forever. This is a myth, an absolute myth that has been, is widely accepted. Um, and and the, the sort of the PR of the ranchers and their advocates has been very successful. That people sort of think this was always supposed to be the intent. It really wasn't. It, it's sort of a gaslighting uh, in a way, and, and uh, I've noticed that if you ask for, uh, you know, chapter and verse about the uh, perpetuity, that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's never forthcoming, uh, because I think there is nothing uh, in, in writing. Um, uh, Dr. Griffin, who you mentioned, is, is on the phone. I just wanted to acknowledge him. Uh, uh, the um, nonetheless, nonetheless, it is part of the charter of the National Park Service, is it not, to preserve uh, both cultural uh, and natural resources? So, uh, I mean, I realize that there's a lot to say behind that that kind of broad statement, but but let's say uh, we argued or researched and agreed that uh, there was no provision for um, renewable leases in perpetuity. Um, what if someone were to say, so what? Uh, they look nice as, as um, Representative Huffman says, and uh, um, what is the issue uh, anyways with them uh, continuing to get renewed uh, leases? It's true that, um, that there are many national parks that are historical national parks, Harriet Tubman and um, uh, various Civil War sites, there the, um, the prime concern is preserving history. Um, this is not one of those parks. This is, uh, uh, preserving history is not, is not mentioned, uh, is not mentioned in the enabling legislation. Uh, so that, so that, uh, it, well, I, I have language here someplace. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, um, what the, what, what the Clint Miller's law says is the Secretary of Interior shall, who, uh, the land, the, the park, this park will be administered by the Secretary of Interior in a manner which provides for such recreational, educational, historic preservation, interpretation, and scientific research opportunities and, as are consistent with, based upon, and supportive of the maximum protection, restoration, and preservation of the natural environment within the area. So this is the priority of this park. It is not cultural, it's not historical. By the letter of this law, it is, it is to preserve, to give mass, maximum pr protection to the environment. And, um, and if you think about it for about five consecutive se seconds, commercial cattle ranching in a park where um, is, is, is incompatible with total pr 
the maximum preservation of the environment. If you know anything about cattle and what they do, th th these things, these things uh, are not compatible. And, and do you think that, um, that, that I have no trouble with that uh, as a claim, but do you think that we're in any different position evaluating that particular claim that uh, uh, ranches are incompatible with maximum protection uh, from say 62 or, or shortly after the start of the park uh, to, to the present day? I mean, are, are the, the, the state of our knowledge has changed in a way about that. Um, could, could you, I mean, does, does it make sense to you that uh, there's a different um, analysis now uh, than, than there would have been in the 60s when the legislation was drafted? Do you mean a different analysis of, of the effect of cattle on landscape or? or yeah. I, yeah. About, well, and on the climate. In, in some and some climate, yes. I, I mean, I I, uh, I don't think so. I mean, uh, there there are people, there are advocates of ranching who think it's um, who think it's it can be done well. I myself have yet to see one of these these remarkable operations. It, if you're looking for it in Point Reyes, you won't find it. Um, you know, the the according to the Park Service's own uh, studies. Um, Cattle in Point Reyes are the prime greenhouse gas generator in Point Reyes methane from either end of the cow, more than the, all the exhaust pipes of all, all of us who go out there. The, the, the exhaust pipe of these cows at either end, um, uh, of all the operations of all those four stomachs in between, um, generates a, a tremendous amount of methane, which is, you know, per molecule, it's 20 times, 20, 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So. In that respect, um, nothing has changed. Um, the Park Service also uh, acknowledges, and, and as a result of its studies, that um, that Keoho Creek drainage, for example, uh, who drains out to the Pacific um, from the northern northernish end of the peninsula, is one of the most polluted polluted streams in in California, from fe you know fecal coliform runoff, nutrient runoff into streams with eutrophication of streams. Uh, one of the worst in the states in a national park. This is not this is not normally what we want in a national park. National parks are sort of symbolic of how to supposed to be symbolic of how we are supposed to uh, treat the environment. So, uh, uh, so no, not in not in this park. Um, I, I don't think things have changed in this park. And and the the attitude of the the attitude of the ranchers. They're, they're good people. They're they're not bad folks. Um, they're uh, very few of them are rich. They're they're not dilettante absentee ranchers, but they do have a good thing in this park. They they sold the land. They bank the money. Their families bank the money. They're living on um, on uh, uh, substandard grazing fees, paying maybe a, a a third to a half what what most um, ranchers on private land in in uh, Marin have to pay. They're paying token rents for the 1857 uh, classic house in, in uh, Home Ranch, the owner pays $257 in, in the Bay Area um, a month, $247 a month in, the, um, in, this, in this real estate market we have in, in, Cal in, in the Bay Area. So it's, it's a good thing they have. The, um, the, the Park Service uh, main, builds and maintains the fences and roads, which are shattered by milk trucks, as anybody who's been out there knows. They, um, they, they pitch in on buying a barn if a new barn is needed. Uh, the, the ranchers are responsible for routine repairs, but uh, big repairs, the Park Service does. So it's a very sweet deal for these people. And, um, and it's at the expense of the, par of the normal values of a park. If you read the Ranchers Association's um, scoping letter for the general management plan that's now being uh, decided by supposedly by the end of this month, by the, by the end of summer, this report this report will come out. Uh, the, the report the, the Park Service will have made its decision on what of the various alternatives f futures for this park they'll pick, and what the ranchers want is no limit on the number of cattle they graze. 
on the land. And we know from experience that people like Kevin Lenny has been caught grazing four times as many cattle as his allotment. The ranchers want uh, the right to, on their own discretion on national park land, to remove native or invasive vegetation by fire or herbicides if necessary. They want rolling leases in perpetuity for their ranches. They want, the ranchers want, if, if some ranch fa ranching family decides to give up its lease, then that family who sold this land to the government, and it's now our public land, that, they want that family to be the one to choose who's, uh, the next family that comes in. It's this thing that happens um, with, with stockmen on public lands. It, you see it in an extreme case in the Bundys. They begin to think this land is their own. And, uh, and this is what we're seeing here, where um, the, 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 they want less public access. They want no more public access to the pastoral zone. They want, um, they want all the elk uh, in the, the Drake's Bay herd fenced. So, so these are not sensibilities that are compatible with residency or in a national park. And, um, and, and, and the question I always have is, um, why? Why? Why, should, why should taxpayers subsidize private ranching in a national park? Um, how did we get into this fix? Uh, how did we get into this fix is uh, maybe a good next. You know next what I think for... is, I think what, it's a funny thing. We're, we're, we environmentalists are dedicated to the cause and we fight for it very hard. But for these ranchers, it's actual livelihood. It's actual the money they maintain. And they have outgunned us. They, they have out PR'd us and they've out schmoozed us with politicians and they've succeeded. These 24 ranching families in Point Reyes have succeeded in getting Jared Huffman, for example, to take their side against the 4.5 million park visitors who go to see scenery. When you say, when you said earlier, it's, it's uh, well, it's beautiful, the, the, the farms are beautiful, maybe, but your own analysis of the public commentary uh, says otherwise. It says that people don't, you know, one of the things that Huffman argues is that people go, go to these, they like to see these farmlands that go through. No, they don't. They, they, they drive through the ranches um, to get to the beaches and to get to the trails. Um, they don't stop at the ranches. There's no interpretation program in these ranches. In fact, the ranchers run park visitors, the owners of the land off. They, it's, it's common practice. They will run you off the ranch, even though you have every right to be there. I was run off of home ranch. A guy attempted to, Gino Lucchesi, the owner, attempted to, to run me off. Came up to me very fast on the, on the middle of the road past his ranch house, said, you know you don't belong here. He had a lot of fake Park Service signs set up at either end of the ranch. He, he, he found the Park Service sign maker and contracted him to do these signs. Park Service tolerated these signs. Uh, he said, you know, you don't belong here. I said, you know, this, this is exactly where I belong. I'm an American taxpayer. Um, and I'm going to continue down this road. And uh, I'm bigger than him. So it was, uh, it was, easy for, it was easier for me. And, but, um, but, but, you know, this is common. The, 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 what, to, what is there in it for the public in these, in these historic ranches? Number one, you can find just as historic ranches everywhere in Northern California. I can show you any number of wooden, wooden mills and old buildings and old water towers. Um, so why in a national park is it necessary to, to feature this at the expense of the environment? It's, it's happened to me uh, and, and uh, I have friends that like myself go into the park frequently to uh, take photographs and you know if a if a bobcat goes under a fence and into a field as a photographer you're inclined to follow uh, that cat and I have had that conversation uh, what are you what are you doing here is is the question normally and uh, your answer is better I, I tend to say something like I'm enjoying my national park but it you know uh, sometimes goes okay and sometimes doesn't it's not, um, only your, it's not only your inclination to go to un, go under that fence after the bobcat. It's your absolute right. It says so in the permit that these people sign. 
they sign a, they sign a permit saying you are to expect people on the, the roads through your ranch. And I actually checked it before I went to, um, before I tried this, because I knew Gino's reputation for running people off. I went into the enforcement officer. I said, can I go through there? And he said, yes, you can go through that. That's your right. Just don't go in the house. Don't go in his house. I'm fine with that. So, uh, so, right. so what is it in it for the public on this public land? Why, why, why is a third of, of this rare national park, this extraordinary national park, devoted to commercial cattle? There are between 600 and 700 million tons of cattle on the planet. It, they are the most, the cow is the most biomassive creature on earth. It, those, the, the weight of the, the, the biomass of cattle is twice, approximately twice the weight of humanity. Um, do we need more cows? And do we need them here in this national park? Uh, I don't think we do. It, you, you quote those numbers on a day, I think it was today that a study came out from the World Wildlife Fund. People on this call may have seen it uh, about the steady decline in, in um, numbers of animals, wild animals uh, uh, around the planet. Um, I, I wanted to say about the, oh, please go ahead. Well, I was just saying the figure I, I've read, and, and these figures are obviously ballpark figures, that 60% of the, the mammal biomass on the planet is livestock, mostly, mostly cattle and pigs, you know, sheep, goats, yaks, some others. So 60% livestock, 36% humanity, and 4% now is wildlife. And that figure just makes you want to cry. Uh, um, because what was it when I was a kid, you know, 70 years ago? Um, I don't know what the numbers were, but I know they were better than that. And of course, 10,000 years ago, it was 98.67% um, wildlife and, and a couple of domestic dogs, you know. So, so wildlife hasn't done too well in the, in, in the, in the, in, in the age of man. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, it, it uh, please do. Um, and you mentioned the general management plan, and uh, it, it might have gone by a little quickly. I, I bet there are some people on the phone who are all over it, but just to, to make sure that that uh, is, is explicated here properly, could you say a little bit more about the general management plan, what's in it, what's the purpose of it, and sort of what the current status of it is? The, um, this, 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 this business started when um, uh, this whole business of alternative plans for the future began with the, the drought of 2012, 2014, which killed half the herd in, in the Tamales Elk Reserve at the tip of the peninsula. Um, they couldn't get to water and, and some thought that they couldn't get to selenium and copper, which are, are uh, minerals they need. Uh, it's not exactly sure what proportion of was the problem. The problem was the fence. The problem was the elk proof fence built at the behest of the ranchers to keep uh, the elk out of there, not out of there, but out of the rest of the park. So uh, Huey Johnson, who we just lost of Resources Renewal Institute was so enraged by, he's a hunter. He, he, he has an ethic of, um, he was a hunter. He has an ethic of, of how you treat an animal, even when you shoot it. He thought that death by thirst of half the herd of elk in this park was a crime. And, um, and, and just to remember that these elk, these elk have been brought back from the absolute verge of extinction. The, the, the Thule elk is a subspecies of elk that some think were down to just two, an Adam and Eve of elk. They were, re, they were discovered, they were thought to be extinct. They were rediscovered in Southern California, uh, a, small, a small herd and slowly built back from that. The elk in, in, the elk in Point Reyes are, a, the, are the only elk, Thule elk in a national park. They, they are the signal achievement of the Park Service in one of its obligations, which is to, is to re restore ecosystems and to restore extirpated species. This is their triumph in that area. And it's a tremendous one. There, there are 450, 500 elk in that reserve now. And, and the two smaller herd, the, the, there's 120 something more. So, so um, that's the, the backstory. So Huey was enraged and he and three other outfits um, his Resources Renewal Institute and three other outfits sued the Park Service they, when the, for not having a management plan. They haven't updated their management plan since 1980, which is a violation of policy. They, um, they have never conducted a 
comprehensive analysis of the impact of ranching on this park. And that is a violation of the Endangered Species Act. So, so the Park Service had, had no legs to stand on, they settled. The settlement agreement acquired, required a, a range of options to be uh, considered by the Park Service. Um, uh, alternative A was to leave things as they were, status quo, nothing changes. The other end of the spectrum was, um, was alternative F, no more ranching. There were a number of gradations in between, A, B, C, D, E. Um, the, the Park Service, in spite of studies that show that, um, uh, in spite of the, uh, Paul Satan's uh, history, which shows that it was never intended ranchers be here forever, in spite of all the studies showing pollution uh, of air and water, um, in spite of this, they, they picked prop, uh, alternative B. And alternative B means it gives the ranchers everything they want, almost everything they want. It gives them um, the right to diversify, their word is diversification, diversify their agriculture from cattle to goats, sheep, pigs, chickens, to row, to row crops, artichokes, um, to build bed and breakfast in the park, and, um, and, and it provides for uh, culling of the elk that annoy them. Uh, the elk of the, these southern herds, which they say are eating their fodder. Well, if, they, if you read their permit, I think it's uh, Article 12, it's called Wildlife, it says, and, and, and all ranchers have to sign it, it says, uh, you are to expect, it's to be expected, that, that wildlife will eat your fodder and that they will damage your fences. And this is to be expected in a national park because this is a, uh, it, it, the purpose is to preserve wildlife. And uh, the ranchers sign and they promptly join the Point Reyes Ranchers Association, which is called Elf Fences Now and is totally dedicated to control of elk. So, um, and, and, they, and they say, and the number one complaint, if you look at the website is, they take our fodder and they ruin our fences. Well, read your permit. You're, you were told that that's what you were to expect. These people think the land is theirs. It's not, it belongs to the rest of us. Where am I going with this? Uh, uh, just, um, what were we starting out with this? Uh, uh, you were talking about, what was the question? Uh, what was the question, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had asked you to uh, uh, sort of update people about the general manager. Oh, yes. Well, I, 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 I didn't read. The, the crucial part is the, the Park Service preferred alternative is this, is this one, B, that gives everything to the ranchers. It's, it's, it's a total um, abrogation of their, of their responsibility to, to take care of the land and to manage uh, and to manage th this park correctly. You know, the Park Service has a lot of institutional knowledge and memory about how to manage wildlife and how to manage park visitors, people. Managing ranching is something they have absolutely no experience with and they have a terrible time with it. And the ranchers are, uh, the ranchers are outmaneuvering them. There's um, uh, among, some of the ground you covered there, I wanted to mention that there is some concern uh, among people who uh, are knowledgeable and paying close attention that um, the current conditions may cause another die-off of uh, the elk uh, north of the fence. I mean, there, there could be controversial arguments one way or the other, but there have been elk carcasses and there are uh, ever drying conditions and fires nearby and so on. So I just wanted to to throw that in there. When you mention um, diversification, which always sounds like something we're supposed to be in favor of, it's a good word in general. Uh, one thing that um, comes up with that is that if they bring in uh, other livestock, um, there undoubtedly will be conflict with other kinds of predators. I don't know if there's much more to say about that. If, well, it's uh, true. You know, do. cattle. Cattle can take care of themselves against coyotes and against, they can protect calves against coyotes. They can, cougars don't seem to take, take cattle on the ranch. We have mountain lions in Point Reyes, thank God. And, and, um, but what happens when you have sheep there? And what happens when you have chickens? What happens to the badgers, the weasels, the coyotes in the park? Um, we know that we know, well, we can't prove it, but, but there's no question that, that 
ranchers take some now and occasionally have shot elk. Uh, can't be proved, so I should probably withdraw it. But, but what is going to happen when you begin to have, you know the history of the West and you know how ranchers respond to predators. Um, what happens when the row crops, beans, and which they're talking about beans and artichokes, what happens to folks like you and me who already are getting run off the land when that land is, is artichokes? I mean, our land, it's our land. We're taxpayers, we're American citizens, we're park visitors. The, that park is for us. What happens when, when artichokes get in there? Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not gonna be good. And, and who's, and has Jeff, Jared Huffman thought that through? I don't think so. Jared Huffman is one of his ideas for culling elk to make it sort of PC is let's invite the Indians to do it. Um, let's have some Indians do it. Somehow that makes it, well, if red men are doing it and they're Aborigines and indigenous people, it's sort of right. Uh, well, he, I mean, has he thought that through? This is Miwok as, as, as uh, it was said at the beginning, this is Miwok Ohlone, not Ohlone here, but Miwok country in, in the Point Reyes. Um, there are Miwoks here. They're in the Greyton here, Ranch Sharia. The, what a, they think of it as their land still. They have a sacred lands committee. Nick Tippin is, is the chairman. He, um, he's very interested in what happens in Point Reyes. He was very against the oyster farm for what they were doing on sacred, what they were doing to shell mounts. What our artificial, you know, Japanese oyster shells were doing to the real oyster shells that belong here. Um, so, so what happens when you have a bunch of Sioux coming into Miwok country. I mean, you know, um, it's, it, it's not, I'm, I'm sort of being funny, but not really. I mean, you, you, it, it, none of this stuff is thought through well. Yeah, Jared is being um, somewhat ham-fisted about the whole thing, or, or that might be a, a, a kind way uh, to characterize it. I, I wanted to pick up on, on one other point you made along the way, which is about the public's uh, feeling about this, because as you mentioned, this is something that, uh, I worked on and uh, the Resource Renewable Institute and myself and, and a number of volunteers read every comment uh, submitted to this plan because they had to accept public comments. They got 7,627 comments and the public is overwhelmingly in favor of wildlife and against commercial use and ranching and dairies uh, on, on, in the park. 94% of people who mentioned any of those alternatives, who endorsed any of those alternatives, endorsed alternative F, which is getting rid of ranching and dairies altogether. So this idea that you know the public likes it as it is might be a convenient thing to believe and repeat, but it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't match the facts. I mean, it, it's overwhelmingly clear. So that's, yeah. that's something yeah. to when we yeah. The interesting thing to me is, is um, the response to the Park Service. As, as the, the, these numbers you discovered began shaping up, and I'm sure before you did your tabulation, the Park Service was aware of how it was skewing. Um, and they sort of did this preemptive thing. Well, public commentary is not like, it's not a popularity contest. It's not like a vote. Um, and, and which is interesting to me. So if it's not sort of like a vote, then why did you conduct why did you ask the public in the first place? You know, um, uh, uh, to, to ask for public commentary and then dismiss the public out of hand like that is, is interesting to me. And it just shows where the, you know, it's, 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 not, about, it's not about the good of, the, the greater good of, of many. It's, it, we're skewing to, the, to these 24 ranching families. God bless them, but, but there are other lines of work. Would it be possible Let's to talk, uh, please? Um, yeah, Michael, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, hello, everybody. I'm I'm the photographer that um, I've actually worked with Ken before, and I did the Bay Area Wild book with Galen Rowell, and um, uh, the Environmental Action Committee brought me in a couple of years ago uh, to photograph. We we went through something very similar with the. Uh, the Drake's Bay Oyster Company there. And uh, the Environmental Action Committee brought me in to photograph and document what was going on out there during that whole controversy. And um, 
it, it was kind of shocking to me. I, I hadn't really gotten out there before, but there was pressure, there was hundreds of feet of pressure treated wood in the water they built racks out of uh, that had arsenic in the wood. There was plastic everywhere. And when Galen and I did the Bay Area Wild book, um, the, the cattle damage out there, I, I, I live in Marin and, and have spent a lot of time out there, but the cattle damage out there is pretty significant. And, and one thing that hasn't been really talked about um, is the fact if, if the cows came out of there, which, which I certainly believe they should, there's, there's tens of thousands of acres of cattle land all around Point Reyes um, already. Uh, but, but if the cattle came out, most of those fences would come out of there. And it, the place would have a completely different feel than it has, has today. And I, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank, thank you for that, Michael. Yeah, it's it's um, it's something that um, it, it can, I'll I'll be brief. And, and uh, the what strikes me about what you said is it, it's not only is it true about the the erosion and the impacts in the park, but this is documented and not particularly controversial. So as I read the general management plan, it says the operations are bad for the air, the water, the soil, the vegetation, and the wildlife, including the elk, but let's expand it and, 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 and lock it in permanently, which seems to me to make no sense whatsoever. Ken Brower, please, what your, your comments on. Yeah, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, one of the, the you know, the, what we talk, I, I have some friends who are ranchers and they, they they have this sort of satellite view, you know. Um, uh, uh, well, if, they, if the cows were gone, the coyote bush would come in, and you you wouldn't be able to see uh, these wonderful pastures. You know, their, their ideal is is uh, is is, gra is low grass. What a, what fun it would be, as Michael says, uh, to to take the fences out and begin to watch the, the process of su succession. What would it be? I mean, people study this. People after glaciers recede and after the volcano uh, cools off, you go back and watch what comes in. And it's, it's, there's a whole science of it, and it's fascinating. What would come in? What would come in uh, if all those, if out at H Ranch, an I Ranch out there, which is now lots of silage where, where they plow, uh, you know, where the disker goes through every, uh, every season, and you have these huge flocks of ravens following, uh, following the tractor to, to, to eat the macerated nestling birds and stuff that, that are eaten. Suppose instead of having that short grass, you had habitat for birds, for other animals, um, and, and watch it come back in. It would be fascinating. And, and don't forget that the, the whole of Point Reyes National Seashore was a ranch. Um, we, we see what happens to ranch when you uh, leave it alone. And, and um, you know, Bear Valley a Trail was a road, was a, um, was, was a ranch road. And, and look what we have there now, you know. Um, uh, so, so it's not like the land isn't going to come come back beautifully. We um, uh, thanks again for that, Michael. And and the the last topic that we sort of wanted to cover, and we can throw it open for for more questions, is is we were starting to touch on it already. Is what the park um, might be. So, uh, Ken, I know this is. Um, this is uh, something that I've heard you speak about before. Um, you know, what if, well, it's two things. Is one is uh, why not compromise? Uh, as you know, somebody says, let's get them entirely out there. Somebody else says, uh, expand it. Compromise sounds good. Balance sounds good. Why not um, meet in the middle somewhere on this is, is, well, actually, let me just leave it at that and, and ask you that for now. And, and, and safe part B for a follow-up. What do you think about the idea of a uh, struck compromise between the expansion that's uh, on the pallet and uh, uh, getting them out entirely? Um, you know, compromise sounds like a wonderful thing and we all should do it. Um, uh, it's the nice thing to do um, and it's the reasonable thing to do. Um, my father's argument on this was was almost central to how he approached environmentalism. He said, um, he says, our job is not to compromise on, on these issues we care about. Our job is to 
in the environmental movement is, is fight as hard as we can against that dam or against this bad logging project or for this park to, uh, or natural reserves, fight as hard as we can. Um, we've lost too much already in the, in the environmental side. Um, you know, we lose so many of these battles. We're, we're going against the march of civilization and, and certainly the march of American culture, which is to build and, and to tame uh, wild places and to uh, make money. And you're going against sort of the culture and you're gonna lose a lot. The forces arrayed against you are tremendous, are, are powerful. It's, it's uh, trillions of dollars are working against you. Um, so your job is not to cave in. It's to argue as hard as you can here for, for your position. And um, let somebody else compromise. Let the, let the politicians compromise is what he said. Let the politicians compromise. That's what we pay them for, he said. Our job is to, is to argue as hard as we can on our crazy fringe position. And if we lose, we're at least pulling we're pulling the, the final resolution back toward in our way a little bit. But if you give up at the beginning, and if you enter into these collaborative arrangements with ranchers, the kind of thing that, that the Quincy Library up in Northern California made famous, let's get the loggers environmentalists together. My dad said, no, no, don't do that. Um, that's, that's reasonable. Um, and one of his favorite quotes was from, from the, uh, uh, Nixon's uh, um, EPA, director, um, Russ Train, a friend of my dad's, Judge Russ Train, who said, thank God for Dave Brower. He makes it so easy for the rest of us to appear reasonable. And um, mm -hmm. my dad loved that. He said, right on, I, he liked that. And then he said, he took it the other level. He said, now we need somebody to make me look, uh, 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 to, to, to make me look reasonable. Dave Foreman, he makes me look reasonable. And next, we got to find somebody who make Dave Foreman of Earth First look reasonable. And this is the, this is the way to approach compromise. Um, don't do it. Um, we're not supposed to do it. Um, and this is the mistake uh, that, uh, that I think that Environmental Action Committee of Marin they did. They, they had this wonderful, they, they led the way against the oyster farm. And they took flack and they had uh, toilets dumped in their backyard and they had the Save Our Oyster Farm nailed across the office door in Point Reyes Station of, of, the, of the post people. They were brave, but it was a tremendously uh, 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 erosive spiritual battle for these people because they're living in this community. And it's, it's what happens to anybody who uh, lives in, a, in the Sage Rush Rebellion country. If you're living in a small town surrounded by Sage Rush rebels and, you, and your kids are in school with them and, and you go to the same post office, it becomes very hard to take strong positions. And, and I, I mean, this is just my, I love Amy Trainer, but, and I love the people there, but I think after that battle, they didn't want another. I just feel this. They didn't want to go through it again. And Amy went out and, and the Environmental Action Committee went out and they approached the ranchers to try to get a dialogue going. You need a, you need a, a good faith partner if you're going to embark on something like that. And you probably, even then you probably shouldn't do it. Let them, they're making the best argument they can uh, for their position. They're not arguing for elk. Uh, you know, we need to do our absolute best and argue for the elk, for the weasels, for the badgers, for the mountain lions, for, for all this ecosystem that's, that's out there. Um, that's our job. And, um, and not, not to go halfway. That may bring me to what was planned as, as last question, and, and I think I said this to you before, it, it's a cliche, so I apologize for the cliche, but uh, acknowledging the, what you just said and, and maybe the difficulties in it, if you live in a community where this is controversial, uh, and also acknowledging that we're uh, in, a, in a meeting of the Sierra Club, what do you think that people uh, can do, should do, to try to make a difference in, in this particular battle? I mean, people who have, you know, day jobs and, and are concerned but are not uh, full-time uh, activists. W what can be done? Well, I, I, would, I would wish that, that people who, I, I wish Sierra Club people would put a little more pressure on the leadership to, to come to a more, <clears throat> a more environmental position. Um, uh, I'm disappointed by the Sierra Club's position. <laughs> I think it was, 
I don't quite understand why. This is a legacy of the Sierra Club. This park, uh, my dad's work as a, the first ED, um, the, the, one of our great presidents, um, Ed Weyburn, fought very hard for this park. It's a legacy of the Sierra Club. And I think it should be defended better than it is by the Sierra Club. And, and the Sierra Club has taken no real position on it. Um, they've, they've taken, an, a, 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 I think, a nam, namby-pamby position. They, and and they, they need to be strongly against ranching. They're, they're, it's it's clear-cut. Um, if you're an environmentalist, the issues here are so stark. Um, all we've talked about, the, the, the pollution, um, uh, the water pollution, air pollution, um, the, this erosion of the fields. I mean, just go, go to any ranch, watch these multiple lanes of traffic through, through pastures. Um, it's, it's clear what's happened. There's other things that aren't clear, that, that, that you have to be a little closer to the ground and know some of the people in the cast of characters. The effect on the, on the spirit and the morale of the park service. I don't think anybody thinks about that. I know there's some, there are probably some park staff in the, in the seashore who think it's just great to support ranching. But I know that this is not why Park Service people join this agency. It's not to be met cattle managers. They go because they love wild nature, the outdoors, and wildlife. They're in a position in this park where they know what they should be doing. The political forces um, from the, the Huffmans and the Feinsteins, and, and God knows uh, from the Trump administration, most of this stuff is coming down from interior. It's not being manufactured even at the regional level. This is These are policies that that, um, or pressures that are being exerted from up high. One of the, the problems being in the park service is not, it's not a good place to fall on your sword because they'll let you do it and, and get the next guy in. Um, it's, it's hard to be a brave superintendent of a national park and stick up for your park. I can count on my fingers, you know, a couple on the fingers of one hand, instances where it's happened. Happened in Grand Canyon a couple of years ago. The, um, there was gonna be a big uh, uranium mine on the rim and, and a, and a huge um, imitation Disneyland right on the Navajo reservation, right at the edge of Grand Canyon. And he said, not on my watch. And I almost cried because it's not what you hear from, from Park Service superintendents. So, so I know they're suffering. And I know Cicely Muldoon in her time there knew what she should be doing in her park. But, but she, really, you know, she really doesn't have that decision making power. So I know, I know it's tough on park morale. Uh, to have to, to have to live in this regime. Uh, th thanks for your insights on that. I, I think we can probably, um, Liz, look at uh, something like a, a Q and A uh, uh, period now for this. Ken Brower, thank you very much for all that information and, and passion and and thanks for spending the time with us and i, I think we arranged you could stay around and, and talk a bit or or, or answer questions which we thanks, no doubt thanks for will. the questions thanks for having me uh, yes? absolutely yeah. yeah um just looking through the chat um there's a lot of back and forth totally agreeing with you ken you've got you've nailed it here um somebody asked like are there public meetings and so maybe you could tell us where we are in the timeline of this um, draft environmental impact statement. Well, it, it was, it's supposed to have been out months ago. Um, and now we hear it's going to be out by the end of the summer, which is in what, 10, 11 days. And so, so that's when they said, but, the, but they've, they've got a lot on their plate, especially in the park right now, you know, I mean, they're fighting Woodward fire and, and um, so who knows, but, 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 it's, it's, it's not a hard timeline as, as far as I can see, because it's been shifted, it's been, goalposts have been moving. Yeah, um, your, your comment about the, um, the very um, wimpy response from the Sierra Club was kind of a kick in the gut. Um, should we, uh, I don't know, should we be all writing to uh, uh, Michael Brune and say, hey, you know, get off your duff and do something about this? Or what do you recommend? <laughs> Um, you know, it's been so long since I've been in the Sierra Club. Um, I've done books for them since I, since my dad was kicked out. Um, my dad regularly got kicked out of the, the organizations that he built, and um, because he was a little too fast for the boards of directors. And but he, um, but uh, yes, I would write to I would write to him. I I think this is one of those cases where my understanding is that local 
um, local Sierra Club had a lot to say in the position that was taken and, and that national sort of uh, delegated to them uh, handling this. And, and I, 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 I wish national would step in a little more firmly because, um, because of this problem I, I mentioned that when you're actually out, out on the, out on the, out in the areas where these folks live, it's harder to, to be, t you know, these people, it's harder to take a, a tough position on them, on the ranchers in this case. But um, yeah, I would write to Michael. Michael is, is, a, is a stellar guy. And, and you know, he's, for, for my money, he's the best, he's the best ED that we've had since, since my old man. Um, so I, I, you know, in fact, he came from Rainforest Action Network, which, which was spawned under, by Friends of the Earth, which was uh, the Earth Island Institute, I guess. The, um, the, the uh, one of my dad's later outfits. So, you know, he's, he's the real thing. And, and yeah, he should be, he should try to step up, I think. Okay, sounds like a good deal. We can write to him, and you know their office is right here in Oakland. I think he lives in the East Bay, so let's uh, let's all arrange a meeting with him, huh? Sounds good. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so uh, as uh, as far as other actions we can take, okay. So somebody asked if there are public meetings. There, uh, Huffman is still having his town hall meetings, is he not? We can go to those. I don't know when the next one is. Uh, you know, Huffman has seemed to be pretty impervious to stuff that I that has happened so far. I've been to a couple, you know, where where he has some um, people in, you know, with signs really giving him a hard time from the back of the room, and um, he he doesn't seem to want to move on it. I, it's, it's one of the mysteries to me. Why? What what explains a guy who supposedly is environmentalist? He comes from NRDC, doesn't he? And and uh, as a lawyer, and and um, why? Why, um, why is he taking this position? Um, <clears throat> these, these 24 families versus <clears throat> the American public and, and everybody around the world. It's a, you know, it's a, people around the world are welcome here to this part. Um, I don't understand it. Well, Could I ask you a qu question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh, thank you. I had a question for Ken. Um, Ken, we saw the playbook uh, during the last Lunny go round with the oyster farm uh, in which Alice Waters, uh, Chez Panisse got involved in everything. And it's likely that this battle, if it becomes a battle, hopefully it will, um, will be sort of, the, the ranchers will use the foodie, the organic foodie angle. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how to counter that. Um, I mean, we all support organic farming. We all support local food sources, but to me, that's not really the issue. That's kind of a kind of a red herring. But I wonder if you have any thoughts about how to counter the very popular foodie movement, which will likely be what they use to to fight the environmental efforts. I would say you just have to remind them of the national park idea. Um, uh, very little of this country is in national parkland. Um, there's all kinds of places where you can have organic farming. This is a national park. It has a different purpose. The Organic Act of the National Park Service uh, sets out a totally different set of objectives. Um, uh, the Park Service has been moving uh, from a, its early 1916 preoccupation with, with recreation, has been moving towards ecosystem preservation. 80% um, of our national parks are now either designated wilderness or managed as wilderness. This is the direction the park has been going. It should continue to go. This has been the proper trend. There's lots of places where you can, where you can have organic oysters and organic beef. Um, not in a national park. There's a different idea here. We need to reacquaint re -acquaint people with a wilderness idea. We need a few places where our hands aren't all over everything. To just to see, just to see, just to test theories. What, what's, how does the natural world work? Um, uh, uh, what, what, how does it work without us throwing our wrenches into the, the gears? You know, um, these, these are important ideas that we have to, I think we have to refresh people on. People like Michael Pollan and, and Alice Waters. Uh, my dad could not eat for, could not pay in Alice's restaurant. 
he, um, she wouldn't let him pay because she was a fan of my dad's. Um, and Michael Pollan is tremendous in his area. But, but both these people didn't quite get the wilderness idea. This idea that there should be places where natural processes reign and not our own. And uh, I, I think we need to just say, not in a national park. We, we, have, we have an enormous area of the United States dedicated to, of public land in the United States dedicated to range, to rangeland, to, to cattle and grazing. Um, it's, it's, it's 225 million acres, it's uh, um, square miles. It's 337,000 um, uh, um, acres. It's, um, it's an area the, the size of California, Washington, Oregon combined are now dedicated to uh, private uh, uh, lease hold ranchers working public lands. Um, we don't need to, 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 to include the 100 square miles of Point Reyes. Uh, or, or the, or the 18,000 acres of, of the pastoral zone. We don't need that. Um, we, we can do without it. If we can't succeed without turning that into organic beef, then we're screwed anyway. And Michael, you remember um, going through the oyster farm on our kayaks? Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. just plastic. And it wasn't just, uh, I, I tasted that, um, that green ooze that was coming out of the pressurized, um, not, not with, with you on another trip, of oh, the pressurized yeah. wood on those racks, copper, straight copper. Yep. Um, oh, yeah. Coming out of that thing. It's poison. That's, that's why it's in there. It's to poison my organisms. And, and um, every single one of those oyster racks had, was shaded out underneath. The eelgrass was shaded out. There were trails all through the, the eelgrass where the, the props of the oyster boats had chopped it. And there was oyster sacks everywhere. And every, and, and the people like Michael Pond said, oh, it's, it's a wonderful pro pure source of protein. Well, it's not. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, most people didn't know they were getting their oysters off of pressure treated racks. But uh, what a spectacular place. All those uh, little leopard sharks in schools uh, during the mating season. I mean, what an absolutely rare and spectacular place that Drake Sestero is. And, and, uh, and I think likewise Point Reyes, uh, National Seashore, it's, um, you know, a lot of, some of those meadows might fill in a little bit, but, but if they brought, if they got all those fences out of there and put more elk out there, the elk would keep a lot of those meadows naturally open too. I mean, the whole thing would, you know, Aldo Leopold style, the whole thing could go back and we could, we could see what it's like to restore that property. The elk, the elk did a good job for, since the Pleistocene there, you know, that's, they were the, they were the predominant grazer on Point Reyes Peninsula. You know, what you say is true. You know, I think we need to remind ourselves sometimes what an extraordinary park this is. I mean, here you have a, um, you have a place with, with, with elk, cougars, um, badgers, mountain beaver, all sorts of weasels, um, all the songbirds. You know, this is a Pacific flyway. All, all the raptors are here, all the owls. Mm -hmm. From Inverness Ridge, they're looking down on this incredible marine ecosystem, great white sharks more here than any place in the triangle. Um, blue whales, killer whales, humpback whales, um, gray whales coming by every time, elephant seals, harbor seals, fur seals, these two ecosystems coming together within 25 miles of San Francisco and uh, megalopolis. There's nothing like this. There's nothing like this anywhere in the nation. And we have to remember <clears throat> when we're arguing for against oysters in the park or, or organic beef in the, in the pastoral zone, this, this is an extraordinary opportunity we have. It's, it's a gift and it's, we're so lucky to have this resource. Yeah, this, this should be a priority of the Sierra Club for sure. And, and hopefully the, uh, uh, the uh, action network out there will, will step it up too. You know, it's, it's too bad they're kind of shell shocked, but th that, thing with, that thing with Lunny got really nasty. I mean, I was involved as their photographer and we, we made a brochure that was distributed that showed that pressure treated wood. And I mean, there was some pretty, it got pretty, you know, it, it got pretty hot and heavy, but, uh, but that's what you have to do. You got to fight <laughs> for victories. You got to, you got to fight. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if either of our Ken's, uh, as far as talking about going forward, okay, the, the EIR, produced by the Park Service, which undoubtedly is going to want to uh, choose uh, alternative B, which is keep the cattle and all the other bad things that uh, 
uh, Ken Brower has talked about. Um, after that, uh, lawsuits, what else, what do we have to look forward to here? Well, law lawsuits for sure. And, and um, I mean, there's no question about that. And people are thinking about that already. Um, uh, I, I, I wish we'd done a better job of engaging the public. I don't quite understand why we've not done better at, at, at presenting this case because so many people do care about this part. And, um, and I guess it's again, this problem of, of the, the people who with the real vested interest are, the, are these ranching families who are really um, playing hardball and playing hard. And we, we just, in the movement, we just haven't gotten together. We have so much to worry about. Um, you know, Bruce Hamilton of the club told me this when I urged him to, to try to get a better position on, on Point Reyes, is, you know, we have a lot going on. And, and um, we, have, we have this, that we have Trump to deal with, which is um, something nobody's ever had to deal with before. So, so I, I can understand that, that this place is being, uh, uh, it's getting a little bit of short shrift, but I, I, still, I still wish we'd done a better job. Of, of engaging folks and um, and it's up to every one of us you know um, uh, to, to, to if they care to, 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 to do better yeah lessons yeah. learned um, could I ask the two Kens to talk about uh, the issue that's percolating out there right now about the Thule elk that are behind the fence at um, in the Thule elk preserve at, at Tamales Point there's a concern now that they were going to have see another massive die off like we did in 2014 because they are fenced off and there is no water available. Can you guys comment on that at all? Can you want to? Um... Uh, I, so I can start. Um, I, I'm sure you know more about it than I. Uh, Ken had mentioned uh, along the way that in, I think it was 2013, 14, 15, there was a drought. And uh, if people aren't familiar, in the north end of the park, there's a peninsula and there's an eight foot tall fence coast to coast. The east coast is Tamales Bay and the west coast is the Pacific Ocean. And so there is uh, the main herd of elk is behind that fence and cannot, um, cannot freely move uh, south of it. And in that drought, about 250 animals died of four or 500. And there is some controversy as to whether it was just dehydration or whether it was a lack of minerals, but one way or the other, the park, I mean, many of us feel the park is responsible. That herd is behind that fence and can't freely move. So right now, um, the conditions are gathering again that, that might constitute another challenge to their uh, survival in that way. And people are uh, petitioning the park to um, either truck in water, and you guys may have seen in the LA Times and the Chronicle uh, about a week ago, uh, some people uh, snuck in with water. I mean, I think it was a um, gestural amount of water, but uh, good for them for, for caring and doing it. Uh, the park didn't react well, said it was um, illegal, and, and, and I guess it was, but we all know legal and ethical or moral are not always exactly the same thing. Um, so there's just the question is whether the park is going to look after them and whether they're engaged enough to make sure that there isn't another die-off. And remember, this all happens in the backdrop of the elk being a thorn in the sides of the nearby ranches. So you have to ask yourself, what is the motivation for them really to take care of these animals? Ken, I'm sure I left some things out and, and uh, uh, please. Yeah, I, um, I I um I, I hadn't quite thought of it that way. I uh, that they that they uh, they absolutely have an obligation to to take care of the elk, and because as as I said, this is the great achievement they've made in the park. As far as one of their man mandates is to restore extirpated species, and and this is this is the one. Um, but I wish I, I mean I don't know. I know some of the people have gone in, and I and I think I trust their uh, they've they found six dead elk, of course elk do die. Um, they found low water levels um, in some of the ponds. I, I wish I could trust the Park Service, given their record on the 2012-2014 drought, to 
give me good information on what the situation really is. But somehow they let that one get so out of hand that they had uh, half the herd dead before they seemed to really realize it. So, so I, I would, I guess I would have to listen to some of these people who are, who, 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 who think the water looks awfully low. Um, I would love to have some real elk person go in there and do an evaluation. And, and, um, and so we, so we had news that we knew we could believe, you know. I realize I haven't come up with good um, ideas for what folks should do. I, I, I do think pressure on, pressure on the club uh, or, or trying to get a meeting. I'd love to join a meeting with you guys if I might even renew my membership after 60 years in the club. If, if mm -hmm. uh, it's a chance to go in and talk to Michael Broom, um, I've met Michael a couple of times and, and uh, we've exchanged pleasantries. But, um, but anyway, yeah, I think that would be, that would be something to do. Um, how can you let this, how can you let this legacy of your own outfit sort of go by the wayside? Um, I'd ask him. <laughs> Ken, Ken, I wanted to mention earlier when you, you spoke about Representative Huffman's position on it and, you know, um, there is this idea that he's maybe a goner, his mind is made up and, and that's that. Um, the only sort of plausible or, you know, interesting theory that I've heard as to why he has such a blind spot about this is not really a direct answer, but sort of a proxy answer that Diane Feinstein is in favor of the ranches and that Jared has um, aspirations uh, to be senator from, from California. And so, you know, to me, it's a very interesting question because uh, Jared's excellent on the environment all up and down. He says things like we have to do everything we can to fight climate change and so on. And he, and he, he puts his money where his mouth is, except in his own backyard. I described it to him on, on his Facebook page as reverse nimbyism, quote, reverse nimbyism. And he didn't like it. And he told me to give it a rest. And we had an unpleasant exchange um, after that. So it is a curiosity. I, I don't think it's wasting one's breath to contact your your congressperson anyways I, I i don't think he's beyond the reach of of the um majority view of his constituents but it does seem that he's entrenched uh, on one side okay and, and the two kens um there are a number of organizations that are advocating for point raise and um the tule elk there is an organization called forelk.org. There's the Western Watersheds Project, which was one of the groups that sued in the first place. Um, there are other organizations out there. Can you like tell us about them and uh, maybe put a contact in the chat if you know it? Can you? Well, the, yeah, the um, uh, Renewable Resources Institute is uh, the group that, uh, so it was they, Western Watersheds, and the Center for Biological Diversity that um, um, were the litigants in the lawsuit, the big lawsuit that brought about the general management plan that kind of got the ball rolling and, and uh, has got us uh, where we are today. I mean, we're, you know, we're a little bit behind the eight ball as far as the powers that be, but at least there's a fight. So um, Western Watersheds, RRI, and uh, CBD, Center for Biological Diversity, are the groups that I think of. For Elk, I also think is an excellent, uh, active, young, dedicated group. What they've done is they focused on the elk, and um, it's a good idea as sort of a totem species. Um, the, there is the general uh, issue in, in Point Reyes about, well, the other species and the health of the environment and so on. And, and I don't mean to imply those people are blind to it, but their, their sort of uh, first focus is the elk. So if, if that motivates you for elk.org, as you put in there, Liz, uh, is good. And I'll get the website and I'll paste it in. RRI has a website that um, is, it's not called RRI, it's, it's, it's a name for this or website for this particular Subproject of theirs, and I'll get it and paste it in the in the uh, chat here. 
Thank you, Ken. Yes, I sort of wish, um, I kind of wish that for the elk would, would more often sort of refer to the whole, I agree with Ken that it, I think that the way we should think about elk is, is like a totem animal, it's sort of a keystone animal in a, in a political way to, to, to call attention to this much larger problem of the whole ecosystem. We got to think ecosystem. And these, these elk are representative of all these other animals that we've been talking about, the cougars, the, the, uh, the badgers, everybody who lives here, um, because that's what's at stake. Uh, uh, the elk are just one animal. And I wish, I myself wish that when they, that they would kind of occasionally say that and, and expand it to, hey, these elk represent a, a whole ecosystem or, or symbolic of a whole system that we need to watch out for. But this group, I have to say, is the group that's 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 causing a stir in the press with the with these actions that they're doing. So they're they're calling attention to the problem better than the sort of state and more uh, less theatrical of us um, have failed to do. <laughs> I have a question. I don't know. You're, we're not doing the raising hand things here. Can I? jump yeah. in here for a minute okay so there's there's a bunch of groups laura cunningham's point rays rewilding network um is one of them uh, but and julie phillips nature-based teaching at nature-based teaching teaching.com she's the foremost expert on elk really everybody here should be looking at her stuff and this conglomeration of groups that's been meeting um every other week on zoom and it's uh, diane gentile was the one leading the groups and organizing them um, has put out a citizens action guide and everyone in the Sierra Club should have access to the citizens action guide because it also tells who to write and, and we and it keeps getting added to all the time so it's really a, a fantastic resource for who to write what to write um, and yeah and and like the, the organizations that are working really hard on this issue so um, I'm not quite sure how to get that to maybe by putting it on the Sierra Club website, maybe, which I started to write down and then I something happened when I was writing it down <laughs> and I lost it. So maybe you could put that up on the screen again and show everybody. And I'll put in the, uh, another link for um, Diane's. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I'm sure Diane Gentile would like to have more input, more people. We're trying to get as many people as we as you know as possible. So that would be very cool. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Linda. Those are yeah. the right the right name. I had pasted earlier about Julie and Laura, who are uh, uh, um, fantastic experts, real authorities right. on this. Oh, okay, this is excellent. Um, I'm trying to think if uh, anybody like wants to connect with one of these groups, Ken and Ken, or um, what's the best way to do that? You've given them several links here in the chat. So look at the chat um, and you all know if you're in the chat and you go down to, to where it says to everyone, there's like a box with three little dots. Click on the box with three little dots and it will say save chat. You can click that and it'll save the chat. So if you like, can't remember all this stuff that's in, in there right now, it'll save it to your computer and you can look at it later and sign up for one of these many very worthwhile groups. Oh, and we'll save point raise. All right, are there any other questions? Did I, am I missing anybody? Any other, or comments even? Questions or comments, all welcome. What, what is the group that was mentioned that was with Diane Gentile? What group was that? Um, Linda, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, the thing is it's not, it's not a specific, it's a conglomeration of groups. Uh -huh. And it doesn't have a name. And I, I keep saying that I think we should, I like Ken's idea that we should form a large group and have a name and, and have a political clout. Because yeah. but I know not everybody wants to do that, but I think it would 
it would be stronger, but it's kind of a loose conglomeration of groups that have been working together. And a lot of these people have been meeting on this biweekly Zoom. Uh, Ken, in fact, did a webinar with our group before he did this one. Um, but it's just a loosely organized group. But the person who is in charge of the webinar is Diane Gentile. I don't know if she's in this meeting tonight. Ken, do you know if she's here? I don't think she is. Okay. Yeah. Here. But that's a good contact. Yeah. I'll, I'll, that's, I'll find that link and put Maybe it Maybe add and, her. And in. So will you be um, updating um, the Sierra Club webpage, Ken, with some of the um, information that we talked about tonight? Like links and people we can get a hold of and get involved? And, and Kelly just put that link for Diane's group uh, in, in the chat. Uh, Liz, uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't touch the web page myself, but I, I, oh. I bet some of these links. So if you'd like me to send a summary of them, just an email, you know, as a suggested update, um, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, that would be good. I can't touch the web page either, but Joanne is here. I'll work with her and we'll see if we can include these uh, resources there. Great. But yeah, safe point raise national seashore.com. That's a good one. Uh, also, like about a year and a half ago, the, C, uh, the Green Friday showed a fabulous film called The Shame of Point Reyes by uh, Skylar Thomas. And that's, you can stream that online. Just go to YouTube, uh, put in Shame of Point Reyes, and it's just the most incredible and heartbreaking film you're likely to see. Mm. I wonder if we can, um, we can gather and protest um, at the visitor center. And like, would that even be legal to talk to visitors at the visitor center? Or I don't even know if the visitor center is open. But. Well, Diana Oppenheim has, has advocated for that. We, but then because of the pandemic. Yeah. We, you know, her, she does stuff like that. And um, they were going to go down there and do a camp out. Yeah. And some of us were going to go down and like bring food and water and everything. Then we've had the pandemic and the fires. So it's. But Four, four Elk, in fact, did have, have a couple of actions did. or staked out the visitor center and talked to, and had signs and talked to people. So I, they, they weren't arrested. So they actually do that numerous times and die. And um, because I've been to several of them and at, they were allowed um, to be in the area that they were at, at the visitor center, as long as um, you stayed in that specific area. And it was very informative. It wasn't like yelling in people's faces. Or anything. <laughs> yeah. Very well done. And to give information to the general public. I mean, this is Ken Brower. I, I was I was going to say that that civic action or guide that you talk about is is online, because if if you could add that to the, if you could add that to the mix of of these links, that would be because I hadn't heard of that. Ken, <laughs> yeah, I under I think it's under. Um, well, I can't remember if it's under Diane's or the RRI. A website, but it's it's oh, a click. Uh, yeah, one of those. Other Isn't it on there. the Safe Point Reyes National Seashore dot com, which would be? Um, I I think so. Which is Di I think that's Diane Gentile's yeah. website. So or email. I'm pretty sure it's that. Hmm. We have to find out for sure. <laughs> I have it here. <laughs> Let's see. Where did I get this? We'll, we'll get it there. I, I, was, I was saying I had gone to a couple of those um, uh, um, demonstrations at the visitor center. And, and yeah, we were asked to stand in one certain place, which they referred to as the free speech zone. Yeah. And, you know, many of us thought the whole country was that. <laughs> One little patch of ground away from everybody is, is where they want you to be. So even though the final EIR is being released, um, does that still have to go through another public comment or 
um, it still has to get a signature or something on it, right? They were asked, I'm sorry, I can't remember if I said this, they were asked to extend the public uh, comment period. They were asked by RRI and I think another couple of groups because of the pandemic and because um, there's so much controversy uh, around it. Um, I mean, I don't know it's speculative, but I don't think they're likely to do that. I think they're likely to say, be it is, like it or lump it. And, and as Ken Brower said earlier, then it's probably in the courts. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah then, then maybe we can get some kind of, um, we call it when CEQA goes to court. Um, um, like if we get the judge to um, say, um, you know, cows don't belong, you know, cows do damage to the environment in the sensitive area, they need to leave. If we get the judge to say that, then it will actually be in the books and it may even help other places. So yeah, I guess court would be next. Does the Sierra Club have like a budget for going to court? Mm. <laughs> Good question. I know I, I'm in Coho Salmon Recovery and the fish swim um, through Tamales Bay to head into Lagunitas and Alima. Yeah. We spent a lot of money on coho salmon recovery. Um, are there any, um, you said that the Tuolus Bay is very polluted. Someone said that. Um, is there any place where I could get some information on like when do they test the water there? Who's oh. responsible for making sure the water is safe and clean? I, I bit about that um, and, and in fact uh, one thing to say is if you go to that um, save point raise national seashore.com they have links to the recordings of earlier Wednesday webinars and one or two uh, were about water quality the the creeks from the park drain um, west into the ocean and east into Tamales Bay um, what what we know is that um, when the creeks are tested, they, they generally do very poorly. Uh, there is the um, state uh, regional uh, water quality board that has the power to uh, levy fines and, 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 and take legal action. And um, what generally happens, this was presented at, at one of those mm -hmm. webinars, who generally, they do tests, they fail miserably, and then the board issues um, exemptions uh, and you know, and, and rubber stamps uh, exemptions, usually with some verbiage towards remedial action that needs uh -huh. to be taken. And then it happens, and then a, a year later it repeats, and a year later it repeats. So uh, that particular webinar there was, um, I think, a call to write to the uh, water boards about that. Um, I don't know what came of it. You know, how many people did it? If if they are, if they react at all. Uh, oh, a lot of us did. I can answer that. Okay. A lot of us did, and they just wrote letters back saying that not, there was no evidence for water pollution. That's what they actually said. And they just don't, um, they're not responsive, and they don't, unless you can come up with um, some kind of scientific, like, written documents or whatever, then they're, they don't, um, They'll just write back and, and say, because I have letters sitting right here where they wrote back to several people in the group who wrote to them, and they denied that there's water pollution. They just um, denied. Yeah. Well, could we get the water tested? Can the Sierra Club pull together some money and test the water? The water, the water is tested. I know some of the people who do the testing. The um, the um, it's it's weird that the that they would respond like that because it, you know the Park Service 2013 watershed assessment said that these are some of the most polluted creeks around. So the, the Park Service in its assessment um, says mm -hmm. there's pollution. So 
Can you can you find that and send that out? Because I've been asking about that ever since I joined these groups. I said, where where is that documentation? Where do we find it? So that we can show it back to the water control or quality control boards who deny it and say, oh, there's no no written um, proof of that or something. But like you're saying there is, but I don't know, no one seemed to know where to locate that. It would be really nice to actually have that. In this case, the, the streams they talk about most are the ones that are running west into the Pacific. So Tomales might be a separate problem. Of course, Tomales gets pollution from the other side, from the mainland side too. And um, and uh, I know a guy, Dominique Richard, who does the testing, and, and um, mm -hmm. I could ask him what the, you know, what this score is. But I could, I, I certainly could, I think can find the um, citation on the, that 2013 watershed assessment by the Park Service. Okay. Uh, and um, you might even be able to Google that, just um, quite raise okay. watersheds. By the Park Service. Yeah, and there are databases that are m maintained. Um, and when you look at it, the water quality testing is done very sporadically and very infrequently. There is no good program for monitoring water quality uh, on Point Reyes, either in Tomales Bay or on the Pacific Ocean. And the other thing you see is that the uh, the regional water board is only in charge of water that drains into the Tamales Creek watershed. So all the water that drains to the Pacific Ocean is like not their problem. That's not something that the regional water board mm -hmm. is something they have to deal with. Uh, the Coastal Conservancy or um, maybe because those are water, I guess they're not waters of the state when they're in, it's in the ocean, but there are still are rules for pollution of dumping polluted water into the ocean. There's some, there is some work with the California Coast, Coast Commission and especially with Charles Lester, who's been, oh. some of us have asked about this and, and he says there, there is something the Coastal Commission could do. Of course, he's, he's, he got kicked out by, <laughs> you know he as we know but um too bad because he's a good man and, and um but um so so th there's p possible action there too coastal commission has some purview apparently even though it's well, there's, the, <clears throat> isn't there the com commission and then there's also the california coastal conservancy so they're actually two separate organizations correct Yes, the, the commission is a sort of quasi uh, quasi official organization that actually has some some uh, you know some political weight. Um, I mean, some you know institutional government governmental weight. Mm -hmm. And um, although it's funny, it's an odd. It's quasi you know it's quasi uh, uh, it's quasi. <laughs> mm -hmm. Quasi no about. Hmm. Well, it's it's nine oh five, which is the time we generally <laughs> wrap up. We don't we don't have to wrap up. Hey, this is a Zoom call. We can like sit here and talk to each other all night. I just <laughs> well, no, and I think that'd be great because this has been a terrific discussion, and I'm just feeling a whole lot of energy in this group to uh, try to do something to save Point Reyes. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to take a, this break to say thank you everyone for coming. About half the people have already signed off, the attending. Mm -hmm. So before everybody else signs off, or myself, uh, just thank everybody for coming. Thank Ken and Ken for sharing their knowledge with us and motivating a lot of people to want to get more involved. Um, I'm not saying hang up the phone, but I before everybody else walks out the door, just want to uh, show some appreciation and absolutely glad you're uh, <laughs> being here. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, I have a quick comment. I did write to the California Coastal Conservancy. Um, I've written to a lot of agencies and I asked them what their position was on this, and I got I didn't get anything back. Um, I wrote to Alan Carlton, who is supposedly the chair federal chair of the Federal Parks. 
committee of the Sierra Club of the San Francisco Bay, and, you know, uh, and I said their position was really weak because he was the one that, that made, that wrote the comment in, for the um, public comments for the EIR. Um, and he basically said, oh, we could have, you know, we could do a compromise with the um, um, ranchers and have a better plan or something. Anyway, so when I wrote to him a, two, a long two page letter detailing why the Sierra Club should be on alternative F, which is no ranching heat, all he sent back to me was, thank you for your opinion. That's what he said back to me. <laughs> So I'm looking for more people to write to in the Sierra Club. So I'm going to try Michael Brune, you know, since he's the, the kind of head of the national um, chapter. But sometimes you don't always get, I wrote to the uh, Marine Mammal Center. I said, I think it should be your concern also because there are marine mammals that are being polluted by the water there. And I have like a lot of connections with them, but they didn't even answer me. <laughs> so I think a lot of people don't want to take a position, which is kind of unfortunate, but we, we just have to keep pushing for it anyway, no matter what. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. This was a really, really good um, session. I really appreciate the Sierra Club and Ken Brower and Ken Bully and everybody who's taken part in it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can you hear my voice? Yeah. Can anybody hear yes. me? Yes. Um, this is just a note on the side. Um, the dairy industry itself is sort of going down the tubes because more people are consuming the non-dairy products. In fact, uh, the Canadian dietary guidelines came out and eliminated dairy from their dairy guidelines and really? the u.s is trying is in the process they should be coming out very soon with their 2020 uh updated guidelines and they've had dairy on there and uh physicians committee for responsible medicine a lot of groups have tried to convince them they need to look at the science and get dairy out of the um, thing because there's too many people that have health problems related to dairy it's not necessary for good nutrition so there's pressure on the america the usda um, committee dietary committee to uh, eliminate the dairy so they're sort of going down and the american medical association has gone ahead and made a statement that people do not need dairy it should not be on the uh, dietary guidelines for the U.S. That's the American Medical Association. So keep that in mind. It's, you know, they're sort of having a rough time. They're depending on the government for money to keep them going. And, uh, and they got this situation with the uh, U.S. population. And Canada's already done it. Got dairy off their dietary guidelines. It causes so many health problems. So many. I suffered myself for 42 years before I found a doctor that recognized it. And even the glorious Mayo Clinic did not pick it up when I was eight years old. Mm. So it is an issue. And it's, it's just another sign of what's happening to the dairy industry. So they're hanging in by a thread. Yeah, they're hanging in, not, not really just because of medical opinion, but because they, they, they've been on a downslide forever, you know. Yeah. And, this tens of thousands of gallons, of millions of gallons of milk dumped every year, and yeah. and overproduction, and uh, it's uh, and they know it. They 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 they're they're addicted to overproduction, and so a lot of that, a lot of that, a lot of milk's being dumped, and it's a real pollution problem. Dumped milk. There it is. Uh, there it is. <clears throat> the photographer, um, the photographer mentioned that there was um, the issue of the foodies and. Uh, um, other people have mentioned food scarcity, and when they snuck through the slaughter um, back in Marin after 20 years being banned, a lot of us were thinking that these developing these new niche markets to replace um, the dairy was part of the plan because that would cut the expenses of making lo local slaughter close to Point Reyes. So they didn't have to truck all these animals off to Petaluma, you know, or even further. So I think that, you know, 
um, part of the idea that it's only 23 ranchers or whatever is sort of a misnomer because they have huge tentacles that have been in place and plans in place and they've already, they're already addressing the replacement of dairy because we all know that that is going down, it's down. Um, they have tentacles out into the community in the, um, the, finance, the finance people, is it, you know, is it the tourism? Is it the food scarcity and the foodies, um, the small business, the tax revenue? and these done deals. We had so many letters, we had so many speakers, just like um, Kenneth said, people don't really want it, but they have this bucolic narrative that they have built for decades into the community. So it's almost like um, a cultural identity in counties like Marin that believe this, that don't have the energy to understand strong arguments like Ken's, which I believe in 100%. That argument is good. But then Gerard sneaking in, you know, slaughter like in the Thanksgiving break, you know, and no matter how many people came and talked and how many letters were signed, it seemed like a done deal. You know, the rancher showed up, it seemed like a done deal by the legislators, the people that were voting on it. You know, is that gonna happen to us? I mean, it seems like there's two, there's things like, we don't understand all the tentacles beyond just the 23 ranchers that hook in like the malt and um, you know, all the organizations, even the youth hostels um, have, and the education into the educational community that say, we are bucolic, we are cows, we are cheese, you know, it's our business. How do we address that? And the done deals that are by the, done by the legislators. You know, it seems then, there's also these tremendously powerful farm bureaus that support support ranching. You know, uh, Huey, who we just lost, um, talks about as a, as a resources director for the state how powerful these farm bureaus are, and and their outfits like malt. You know, that are uh, that are, that are on the side of ranching in the park. So so yes, the tentacles are varied and they're out there. It's, it's a it's a powerful business. <clears throat> This idea of um, local food and slow food and, and food security and so on, um, I th it, what's interesting about it is it divides people who might otherwise be uh, clear in their views about a national park because it's, it's typically a liberal issue, it's a progressive issue, uh, it sounds very good, and in a pandemic it sounds very good. Uh, when it comes to me, I try to point out that if you um, if you're interested in food security, beef is not really where you put <laughs> thirty dollar a pound sirloin. Yeah, you know that right. is not really where you put your attention. And and also about um, back to uh, our representative Huffman. And yeah. me, um, well, do you want us to have to uh, truck in meat from Kern County? And, yeah, you know, I don't County? care. <laughs> okay, but as if the beef from Point Reyes doesn't itself get trucked all over the world, right? You can go and sit in a five-star restaurant in Los Angeles and get a Neiman Ranch burger because you can. So it's not as though everything that's consumed here or that's grown here is consumed here. If you want to count the uh, greenhouse gases of trucks bringing food in, then you have to count the greenhouse gases of trucks bringing this food out. And people <laughs> who have a view of it forget to, to mention that consistently. Um, so Judy, you said a lot of things. I just wanted to chip in uh, some thoughts on, on part of what you said. Thank you, thanks. Oh, can I see? Apparently, I just read something from Diane Gentile, but I didn't get the whole gist of it. But apparently, malt is under investigation for having deals uh, behind the scenes with the Park Service. And so right now, that's going on. So I just saw the link to some articles, and they said they were going to send more to us. So yeah, there you go. There you go. 
someone gave me a Christmas present to something like National Seashore Management or something. And I said, oh, I can't do that. I think they're like malt. I don't think they're for the wilderness. And um, so I, I looked at their site and they had the Bukawa cow scenes in the grassland. And I called them and I said, well, how did you vote on this? What do you think about Gerard's um, plan to uh, renew the leases? for the next 25 years or whatever. And they did not get back to me. I finally had to, I don't know how I found out that they were for the leases. And they were the management for the park. Oh. Some organization, I'm sorry, I can't tell you which one it was. But it, they made it look like they were responsible for managing the park. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, oh my God. <laughs> seems hopeful. I really like the idea of you guys trying to put together all the groups and so they can sort of learn from each other and maybe make more impact. Mm -hmm. Like when I went to one of those actions at the center, we stood there and it was so well organized, but nobody, we didn't, we weren't allowed to leaflet. Nobody talked to anybody that was coming in or out of the center. I hate to say it. It was a beautiful action. It was well organized. But as far as the impact, you know. Wow, well, this is great. I wish I could stay on, but my, uh, my uh, pad is going dead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to dominate because I don't know. No, no. What is, and what is your name? Because I didn't, I don't have I'm, your name. It's I'm not Judy Lindo. And I just, I only know Diane Oppenheim. You know, I know her. Yeah. Beauty and uh, Shame of Point Reyes, you know, seeing people's faces and stuff. But I think it's very important. It just in some ways feels hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I get that feeling too, but we, we got to keep working on it. So gosh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to sign out. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Both thank Kens you. so much. This is really, really great. And thank you to Sierra Club. Um, I'll be back in touch. <laughs> Thanks for setting okay. up. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.